Continuing on this week's theme of the energy factor, the effort factor of the five faculties. The last aspect of effort factor, faculty, might be called effortless effort. There comes a time when it just feels like what is carrying us in meditation, what's carrying us in our life, is a very wholesome and healthy um, momentum, effort, engagement, uh, aliveness, vitality. That doesn't seem to be something we are making effort to do. So in that sense, it's effortless from the point of view of our in our work. But it might take a lot of, you know, maybe it takes a lot of calories or something. It is, something is happening, something's working. The, the analogy that uh, I have is for this is uh, when I used to run a lot. I remember that when I began running the first, I don't know how far, 50, 100 feet at least, um, there would be these signals coming out of my body that was basically saying, stop, don't do this. This is too difficult. And, um, and you know, I, I just kind of ran anyway, knowing that I didn't have to listen to those. Some of it was maybe, I don't know what it was, just the making that effort just was just unpleasant. But then as I began running and kept going and going, I would get into the groove, I'd get into the rhythm of running. And, uh, and it would feel like at some point that the running was effortless. It was just, the body was running, it was just running, was running itself. And, um, and it was a great joy. And I'm sure I was expending a lot of calories. So there was a lot of energy uh, being expended. But uh, the involvement, the harmony, the attunement, the uh, relaxing into it, uh, the rhythm of it, it felt just effortless. It was just happening on its own. And I think a lot of activities can be that way. And maybe sports, there can be that feeling sometimes, or maybe playing an instrument or doing something that we enjoy and really get absorbed in doing. Same thing can happen in meditation that uh, if we really give ourselves wholeheartedly to it, to just really place ourselves in the middle of our experience and really, this is what we're doing. Not an easy task. Meditation is harder than things which grab our interest and you know, are fascinating in and of themselves. But, um, but uh, that's part of the benefit of meditation is that uh, we're not being, um, we're discovering how to really be present, really be here in a full, complete way without needing the extra help of fascinating things, interesting things, things which, uh, you know, bring us a lot of joy or bring us a lot of some kind of satisfaction or something, or things which are dangerous. And so we're really engaged and very nicely present because there's some just the right amount of danger. Um, but we're just doing this with just being very simple and ordinary and, and working through all the different kind of activities of the mind, the heart, that get in the way of just that full embodiment of just being here in a simple way, um, uh, not chasing after what interests us or our desires or running away from what we don't want, just here. It's a, it's a, it's a difficult task, but to have that full embodiment and presence in meditation so that uh, when it really happens that uh, becomes effortless effort, it just feels like we're just here. And, um, and that's a wonderful stage of meditation. It's very satisfying in and of itself. And it creates a wonderful platform for uh, a deeper and deeper layers of letting go. Uh, if, it's, if there's something besides us operating, if it's effortless, then it starts becoming clear that the ego, the self-identity, the contraction around self, the sense of me being the agent, um, is not needed as much. And we cut loosening up and loosening up this often this tight grip that 
self has on, on us. This effortless effort space can just kind of help us to relax and soften that. And this topic of effort that we've done this week, um, there's many perspectives on it, but one of the interesting perspectives is it's just an ongoing process of letting go. And, um, and the, with letting go comes benefits. Something arises that, so you could talk about what arises and what comes into place as we practice. But it's nice because the end of the path in Buddhism is a very deep uh, form of uh, letting go, release. It's kind of interesting to go back over these uh, five days to see how each of these steps is, represents a kind of letting go. The uh, uh, initiating effort is the effort that has to, we have to let go of something that we're doing in order to start fresh, start new, start now. So even if it's just starting to meditate, to go sit down to meditate, we have to let go of some of the activities of the day that we're doing. Um, so, you know, stop looking at emails, stop, you know, doing something or other, and then sit down. So we're letting go of something in daily life to sit down and be here. Once we're here, the initiating effort is to let go of uh, the stream of thinking that we're caught up in and involved in that interferes or d d makes it impossible to really be present in a full way. So we're letting go, the initiating effort involves a letting go of some degree of preoccupation. As we settle down further, then this uh, right endeavor uh, aspect of effort, where we can differentiate between what is healthy, wholesome, helpful to be involved in, and what is not. And then we let go of what is unhealthy, unwholesome. And that letting go, even if it's not actively pushing it away or letting go of it, if it's just letting it be in a, in a field of friendly awareness, what we're letting go of is our clinging to it, is our involvement with it. And that's maybe enough. So the thoughts we might are having might still be there, but we really kind of hold them in a very broad mind where we're not actually involved anymore. And so there's a kind of letting go there. And, it, and then, you know, and then some of the wholesome things that arise sometimes just arise on their own. And which gets to the, um, the third, um, you know, the third uh, effort, which is persistent effort, persistent, relaxed effort. That also is a kind of letting go of the things that come along that want to pull us out of the flow of the practice. It's possible to notice a thought arise and find, just be so attentive, you see the beginning of interest in it, and the mind says, no, thank you, and you stay in the flow of awareness. Another thing comes, no, thank you, stay in the flow of the awareness. Uh, when I've really been in that flow of awareness, there was times when I felt that, um, that there was a rubber band attached to my thoughts, and my thoughts would kind of wander off, because I was wandering off my thoughts, the rubber band would get stretched, and at some point they would just pull me right back into the present moment. Um, and so it's kind of this kind of some so effort is kind of you know being kept keep coming back keep coming back involves some letting go and then this dharma energy that can arise that something else is beginning to carry us and to move through us and um, and then letting go of what interferes with that letting go of maybe the idea that I have to do it it's always up to me and me myself and mine but making space for something to move we let go of uh, what crowds the space? We let go of um, uh, the idea of I'm I'm in charge here, and allow the Dharma energy to begin to move through us. And then this effortless effort um, is a place where there can be a lot of letting go of the same thing of self. Effortless effort is almost like a variation or a continuation of this Dharma energy that can arise. But uh, it's also can come to a place of a lot of equanimity a lot of non-reactivity, a lot of non-resistance, non-preference, non-attachment that goes on. And we get a feeling for this kind of equanimity and non-attachment that um, now we kind of are very sensitive to the smallest movements, or the subtlest movements of attachment. And to really allow this effortless effort to kind of flower, there's even more letting go, more letting go. And then at some point, the the uh, uh, 
the, the, the really the, the benefit of really getting in the stream of effortless effort of equanimity is that um, there are uh, the forms of release of letting go which correspond to awakening in Buddhism uh, is not something that we can do. It's not something we can say, okay, now I'm going to be awake, now I'm going to let go once and for all or in a deep way. Um, it's something that uh, uh, there has to be a lot of not self, a lot of non involvement, a lot of non reactivity, a lot of not making anything, creating anything, thinking about things, making a self, um, resisting anything, a lot, a lot of this kind of effortless effort, a lot of equanimity. And, um, and so there's a kind of a lot of letting go has, has to brought us to that point. And it's kind of like in an ancient analogy, it's kind of like a um, rope uh, that over time and weathering has gotten thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. And then at some point, there's just a f- one little thread holding that rope together. And then at uh, some point, that last thread just lets go. The last holding on attachment lets, lets go. And then um, this effortless effort takes a whole different quality. And um, in a certain kind of very profound way, the system, our psychophysical system, recognizes that nothing more needs to be done. No effort needs to be expended of a certain kind. That the, the effort to search for freedom, the effort, effort to move along a path of liberation, to some degree we recognize the place in us where nothing to attain, nothing to do, nothing to be. There's this absence, a beautiful absence of of uh, so many things that crowd us and limit us and propel us and all this stuff. And we start recognizing that in us there exists this place of no effort, a particular kind of place, not lethargy or dullness or inertia, but uh, no effort, no effort is needed. Nothing needs to be done, nothing needs to be attained. And uh, maybe initially it's not a dramatic place, it's just like a, it's clear enough that it's a reference point. And that too is a reference point then to recognize better and better all the places where we still have work to do, all the places where the practice still needs to unfold and develop and grow. And then we still come back to this initiating effort. We always become beginners, starting over, starting over, not trying to hold on to some higher state or some great thing that's the ideal. But when we come back to be a beginner again, to start over again, initiating effort, hopefully the degree to which we let go allows us to do that with greater equanimity, greater, less self, greater ease, um, greater just appreciation and joy at the very opportunity to make effort to practice. We're very fortunate to have a practice, very fortunate to be able to make this effort. And, um, and, and may it be that we can make this effort for, uh, forever together and, um, and find uh, a wonderful way in which we all support this world to become a safer and happier and a freer place for all beings. So thank you. And um, uh, since it's Friday, I had this idea that uh, for those of you who would like to stay on, that um, I'm happy to try with the chat box to answer some questions if any of you have. And before I maybe answer some questions, or maybe some of you are typing one, is um, I wanted to make one announcement that might be relevant for, maybe for you, but maybe for you, you know other people. Because many people are, n- are now sheltered in place, some place they call it in much more dramatic terms, shelter in place maybe is a little bit mild compared to what's really needed now. Or it's, uh, some places they call it more lockdown. Um, and, um, but the, um, in this time, and I, maybe people who've wanted to learn meditation for a long time would like to kind of devote some time to it and so I thought I would offer, I'm going to offer a uh, 
a two-week series every day on introduction to mindfulness meditation, kind of based on the five-week course that I do. But uh, it'll be, it's going to be over nine days, uh, uh, Monday through Friday next week, and the following week, Monday through um, Thursday. And um, so if you know anyone who might be interested in meditation, has lots of time, who would like to do something nice like this uh, every day to kind of get into flow of it, um, you might tell them. It's at 9.30, 10.30 California time, and there's more information on the website. So Chris asks, how much media do you consume about the virus? I actually don't do a lot. Um, I maybe read two or three articles a day, um, but I, I, I'm certainly not keeping up with how much would be useful to know. Uh, or I don't know if useful is the right word, um, that I could know. Um, I feel like I pick up plenty uh, of what's happening. And, um, and um, I feel like I know enough uh, to really be concerned and, and to be, uh, have a lot of empathy and care for what's going on in the world. Um, I talk to people who are affected by the, all the changes that are going on with the virus and what's happening. And, um, and it's pretty dramatic what's happening all over the world. Um, and so um, I guess the question is how much media do I consume? Um, I'm trying to f uh, find a balance between how much would be useful for me to know both as a person, but also as a teacher who's responsive to a community of people who are maybe wanting some relevant teaching at this time. Finding a balance of that uh, versus the other activities that I do and, and a balance between uh, the impact those things have on me and how to stay uh, balanced and not be somehow consumed. So I try to do the news in wise ways. I try to do it in, in time and places where it feels like I can read the news and. Um, uh, in a balanced, relaxed way itself. I, uh, I try to do it in a way that um, uh, I either take it in small dosages so I can reflect on it and live with it, or I try to do it in times where I have uh, uh, my powers of reflection are strong. And so um, I kind of go on to, um, so I can really kind of reflect on what I'm reading and question it and wonder about it and things like that. So that's my maybe inadequate answer to your question. And, and um, someone asks, uh, will we meet at 7 a.m. Pacific time next week uh, uh, of, of, of this weekend? Um, so we're not going to meet Saturday and Sunday, but my plan is indefinitely now to continue these uh, 7 a.m. Uh, sittings and talks. And uh, we're doing this uh, five-week series now on the five faculties. And, We've covered the first two faculties, and next week I'll talk about the five aspects of mindfulness. Um, do we need uh, to know what phase of effort we're at in any given moment? If so, oops, <laughs> um, if so, oh. Oh, how do I get back up there? My, my computer is not quite co cooperating here. Here. Yes, if so, what's balanced way do we do that without getting caught up in that? It's a great question. Um, I think that uh, if your practice is sincere and you're really just engaged and careful, devoted mindfulness and um, making space for the situation, really being present, staying with your breath, developing your practice, um, and you feel encouraged to do that, then there's no, you don't have to know where you're at, how far you've gotten, measuring yourself and all that. Uh, it'll all unfold by itself. It'll all reveal itself to you. Um, there are some advantages sometimes to identify where, where we are in practice because then sometimes we can open to that phase a little bit more fully. We can allow for it. We can appreciate it. We can value it. So there is value to it. That's why I'm teaching this. Um, and um, but you know we have to be very careful not to try too hard, not to spend a lot of time measuring ourselves. 
uh, sit down and follow three breaths and say, you know, how far have I gotten? Like kids in the back seat, you know, are we there yet? Um, uh, you want to be very patient with this practice. And, um, and perhaps if we had, uh, s- you know, six days to do the effort, uh, one, of the, one of the efforts would have been patient effort as well. That could have done... Um, what should I focus on when I'm having a very difficult meditation session and I cannot quiet my mind or focus on the present moment breath at all? Yeah, that's a common experience for all of us. What do we do then? Um, there's a few things and you could do, you might decide to do it. If you're really kind of, your primary thing that you want to do is keep developing mindfulness practice, mindfulness, uh, you might um, uh, just turn towards the very difficulties you're having and let them be the focus of mindfulness. Um, So not to let them be a distraction, but let them become uh, the meditation. Don't try to quiet your mind, but do mindfulness of a noisy mind, of a busy mind. Uh, And... um, and, you know, you don't have to be on the, 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 uh, the breath doesn't have to be the subject of meditation. Uh, the present moment does, but now to be in the present moment with the busy, agitated mind, really feel the agitation, kind of, and that this is where mental noting can be helpful. Uh, the mind is out of control, and you note to yourself, wow, this is a mind that's out of control, it's really busy, really active. And you keep kind of saying that gently to yourself until you kind of like pull yourself out of the entanglement with it, kind of like you step back and you really see, oh, this is what's happening. This is what it's like. And um, uh, a little bit like this, what I do sometimes when my mind is really busy thinking and I can't really seem to get uh, settled down, I'll tell myself, I say to myself the word here, H-E-R-E, just here. And when I say the word, I kind of like open my awareness up to receive and recognize what is here. It's very permissive. It's very allowing. I don't have an agenda. What's supposed to be recognized? Here. And because I'm so caught up in things, that here opens up just for a second or something to what's here. But often then I'll notice, oh, here is a mind that's out of control. Here is a mind that's troubled. And I'll try in that moment and stay with that, and just feel and recognize it. But I'm kind of allowing myself to be the way I am, but I'm stepping back and recognizing it here. And I'll do it again, here. And I do it repeatedly, here. Very permissive, but just to really recognize what's there. And after maybe five minutes of doing that, generally, then I begin to loosen the grip in my mind on what I'm thinking, what I'm doing, that then I can kind of, then it begins to soften and relax. And then I might start focusing my breathing because then I have the kind of capacity to really stay there and develop that. One of the interesting things to do when the mind is out of control and we're having a lot of difficulty or something is to identify uh, if there's an emotion which is fueling it all and then to do a mindfulness of emotions with it, to really feel uh, where it is in the body and hold it and all that things that I'll talk about in this internal meditation class coming up next week. So hopefully that's, uh, you know, a nice answer. And, um, and, um, oh, how does, the last one I'll do here. Um, uh, How to practice in the middle of the night when raw fear arises. Yes. That's easy uh, to have raw fear, especially with what's happening in the world these days. And, and uh, some people um, will wake up in the middle of the night with anxiety and fear um, because, um, uh, you know, the usual distractions, usually things, preoccupations of the day and are quieted down enough that as we sleep, it seems like we touch into some of the deeper layers of what's really operating, what's really going on for us. And, um, and fear is one of those things. And it's not uncommon for people to wake up in the middle of the night and feel uh, with anxiety or fear or something. And um, so um, and I, 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 I've had that sometimes when I, I have a concern for a particular relative who, who has challenges. 
um, I seem to wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning. If I wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, I know there's a little layer of anxiety for me because of around this relative that I'm thinking about. So what to do about it when fear arises? Depends a little bit on how strong it is. A raw fear is a strong term. Um, one of the possibilities is to start mindfulness practice. It might be helpful to actually sit up in bed if you can or go to your meditation cushion because the intentionality of really taking an upright posture or a sitting posture rather than just continue to lay in bed, uh, it gives a little bit of um, freedom. It kind of breaks a little bit the crust of the fear. It's kind of like you're kind of empowering yourself a little bit to sit there in a clear, conscious way and, and, um, and then to feel the fear. Uh, if, unless it kind of triggers more fear to feel the fear, um, to, allow yourself to allow yourself to be afraid. It's not a mistake to be afraid. It's uncomfortable, but... If you're only comfortable when, if you're only free when things are comfortable, you're not really free. So, what does it mean to be free while being afraid? Is that possible? Is it possible to kind of somehow step back from the fear enough that you aren't afraid? There is fear here, and that fear, if it's not you afraid, but if it's you that you're afraid, it's a little bit hard to kind of offer care to the fear. But if you really see it's fear is happening here, then you can bring care to it. You can bring kindness to it. You can offer a safety to it. You don't want to fix it. You don't want to get rid of it. It's, uh, you don't want to see it as wrong or as a problem. But just kind of make space and feel and allow what's going on. And allow yourself to begin experiencing the layers and dimensions of the fear, the beliefs that are operating, the the memories it's triggering. Maybe it connects to early uh, fears we've had in our life that have been reactivated. Um, to feel it in the body, to feel what our relationship to is to fear, and so forth, like that. Um, so, uh, and then if none of that seems to help, uh, and the fear is really strong, then you want to try to do something that's grounding. And um, go get some warm milk, have some food, um, maybe even take a warm shower. Um, sometimes journaling can help kind of ground you and do something. Distract yourself from it. Read a book. Uh, do something that uh, kind of keep, gets you out of the grip of it so that you have more useful presence. And finally, about fear like this, please, you know, please try to hold up yourself with a lot of compassion these days. Lots and lots of care and love and attention to yourself and respect. This is not an easy time that we're going through. And, uh, but it is a very important time for us to really uh, have a chance to work with and look at and, and resolve some of the deeper spiritual, psychological issues on, that, are, that are part of the path to liberation, but seldom get uh, stirred up this far, this easily. So rather than seeing, you know, the feelings we might have with this phase that we're in of our global society, um, someone on a path of liberation, it's, okay, this is where the practice is. Now it's time to really practice with this. This is, I've been waiting for this for a long time. Now it's, I'm ready to work with this fear. So I hope that's helpful. And uh, I want to thank you uh, all for coming here and being part of this and um, I hope that um, this supports you, and and uh, I look forward to doing this with you again on Monday. Thank you. <laughs>